Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Chuck Mason, and with me today is my co-host and president of our sponsoring society, uh, Mount Vernon Genealogical Society, Janelle Blue. And today, Janelle and I are going to talk about her family. Uh, one of the things that we have talked about in putting together programs, we can get people to come and talk about places to do research and you know ways of doing research, record facilities and things like that. But sometimes we also learn a lot by looking at how somebody applied all of these things. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about one of Janelle's immigrant ancestors from Germany uh, who came to Texas, was one of the early pioneers. Yep. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that I had in, in doing the research and also some of the open items that I'm still struggling with. Um, first of all, I'm going to say, what's in a name? <laughs> and you're going to see this screen that shows you all these variations. Now, the good news is that my ancestor had a very unusual name. And so there weren't very many of those guys in Texas, particularly in the county. But if you were a German, how would you pronounce that first word? And you would tell your new neighbors in Texas that your, <laughs> that your name is John Oyeman, right? And not O-J-E-M-A-N-N. -N. And so I put that down because I have found records in every one of those names even the Offerman, and why would you, you know, how would that get in there? Well, uh, when I was going to the Texas Land Record Office, I was going through the index because I knew that my ancestors had land grants. I could find one Ogeman, but it was the brother of my ancestor, and then there was this one that was Offerman, and I thought, that can't be right. But I pulled it anyway, and I looked through the file, and guess what? It was. It was my guy. And there were several um, uh, different documents in there, and each one of them had a little variation on the name. Well, and, and I'm sure that dealing with a German accent, which your ancestor probably had, mm -hmm. and southern accent from Texas, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe add a little Spanish accent in there, Could because, be, yeah. you know... It's understandable why there could be so many variations. And then that last case where it's O-G-E, actually, as a kid, I called my grandpa O-G. That was sort of the short. Now, that, that's sort of later on, though, when the J becomes more prominent. Mm -hmm. But um, there's actually a person who did... Um, some information on uh, find a grave and he has referenced back to some immigration cards that he found and the name is OGE on it and unfortunately it's it's on find a grave it's probably the most complete bio on find a grave right. so every family tree in ancestry and everywhere has got this guy's name as as the person um, and I, I don't think it's the right I don't person. think it's the right one because the date's really wrong. And trying to get them to change it if you find proof. Is... Well, <laughs> I guess eventually, uh, you know, if I can find the proof, that's the other thing is that it's pretty tough. All right, well, let's talk a little bit. You know, sometimes it's good to back up when you're finding an ancestor and you're trying to understand them and think about the motives for, you know, why did they come? Um. Uh, why did Germany let them come? Why did Texas want them to come? And so I want to just spend a few minutes talking about that because I think it's really interesting and instructive. And so I've got the slide to help me remember these little details, but you know what life was like in Europe during these years. Um, there was somebody in control, you know, every 10 or 15 years, the king changed, the country changed, the rule changed somehow. The kingdom of Hanover is where my ancestor said he came from. He did that on his naturalization papers. He did it many times um, he, uh, in, the, uh, in the census instead of saying Germany, because usually what you get is Germany, Germany, right? And sometimes you get Prussia. 
Well, it turns out, and I was a little sloppy in my earlier research on this, I just said he came from Prussia. Well, if you look at that, so um, the kingdom became, uh, in 1814, it became its own entity. And, um, and it didn't go to the Russians till, until 1886, but my ancestor came over sometime in the mid 40s. So, he, so Prussia, yes, Prussia had taken over Han, Hanover at one point, and then they, it was just very short lived. And then they were, you know, an independent, they were part of the German Federation of States. So I, those little things may be really important those, at some those point. Those details really do. I, I have in, in one of my lectures, I have a map out of the source, and it shows the different countries that at one time or another, Germany claimed yeah. at least a part of it. Right. And so to right. help people understand why they have an ancestor from Poland saying they're German. Right. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, they were all over the place. place. The French were in there for a while, you know, and so... So what was going on in Germany, basically, um, at that time? Well, the Industrial Revolution had taken place or was in, you know, it was really beginning to affect a lot of places. And so there was unemployment. There was poverty. The countries didn't exactly know what to do with it. They were sort of limited in, you know, their exports and, and that sort of thing. And so what do we do with all of these people, how do we solve this problem? Well, hey, uh, Texas is interested in, you know, populating some of their lands. So why don't we form a colony in Texas mm -hmm. where we can export our culture and we can also have these dedicated areas um, where um, we can export goods and services, we can import, we can open up all of these things. Now, that was their thinking. Um, and so that made it pretty easy then for um, a, a citizen to go in and apply for immigration. Um, and also, actually, Germany, Hanover, and, and all of the German Federation, um, th they were forming these colonies, these societies to gather up people and mm -hmm. take them over and provide for them. I mean, their promise was that they were going to provide for them once they got to Texas. And they had all these different colonies. Some of you, you've probably heard of some of the Castro's colonies and Prince Psalms and all these people who really did not understand what was going on there in Texas. They no, nobody bothered to do some treaties with the Indians. Um, and so, you know, a lot of those colonies didn't happen the way they were supposed to. But as a result of that, they did get in thousands of Germans to Texas. And so that's why, you know, often you'll hear that they have quite a German, even today there's German populations in Texas. All right, so that's Germany. Um, or Hanover. Now, what was it? Wh why did Texas want all of this? And I I'm gonna. I have a slide here because this is this is amazing. They had a hundred and seventy-one point nine million oh, acres goodness. of land. And when you compare that to New Jersey, Chuck, <laughs> New Jersey had five point five. <laughs> Virginia has 27 million. So here's Texas. Now we're, we're really talking about the era of when Texas became an independent of Mexico. Remember the Alamo? And um, this was in the, like, between 36 and 46, somewhere 1846 or so. They gained, they became part of the United States in the beginning of 1847. But so during that 10 years, um, you know, Mexico, um, the, the Republic was looking to try to, they only had one valuable asset, and that was land. land. And so they wanted to increase their revenue, um, and they had all this land to, to give. So, um, so they, they started working with these different organizations to bring people over to settle the land. And it wasn't just Germany. They were, they were doing, doing a lot of that. Um, and of course, prior to that, when it was part of Mexico, there were, there were land grants done then. And so it became 
these land grants became unmanageable at some point because there was a lot of fraud and things, but I'll get to that later. So, um, so, so that's what, and by the way, when Texas got their independence from Mexico, they incurred all this debt, terrible mm -hmm. debt, and they really wanted to become part of the United States. I think that was the plan sort of all along, um, but the United States said, hey, we don't want to take on all, all this, this enormous debt. debt. <laughs> because you don't have any way to repay it. Right. And so um, that's when they said, okay, we, we need to start getting people in here, getting them productive, starting to get some revenues um, and so that we can begin to be more attractive to the United States because we, we really want to do that. And it took about 10 years to do that, but finally and they did. Well, what was in it for the immigrant himself? Well, I just sort of explained what was going on and the fact that, you know, every so many years there was a new ruler who, and when, when that happens, there's always a difference in how they run the country. country right. Taxes change, uh, property ownership changes, all kinds of things happen. And so maybe they were just tired of it. And I think m my ancestor, I don't know, but he was either a farmer or he was a tradesperson in some way. He was not in the elite area at all. And, and so many of them did not have back in Europe land that they owned. Right. You know, they, they were at the mercy of the landlord and, and rents and things. So, they, they were. So that was a big incentive to come here wherever, whether it be Texas or any other part of the United States, where they could actually physically own a piece of land. But how scary would that have been? And especially when, you know, the, 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 the stories going back to Germany were that Texas was the land of milk and honey right. and that it was really beautiful and the Garden of Eden, when in fact Texas was, you know, hot, it had mosquitoes, it had malaria, yeah. yellow fever, Indians, you know, it, it was a place to be reckoned with. And, um, but, but they sort of made it seem, but you know what, I think some, some people were willing to put up with, with that, that with the idea that they could have land either cheap or free and, and, um, and, and this freedom. And, um, and looking at their conditions at home, you know, it, could it be worse if they went? You know, it was probably in the back of their minds. I mean, I read a book, it's called Coming to America, published by the Genealogical publishing company up in Baltimore. And, you know, it talks about a lot of these issues of people coming over and the fraud that went on and the ship's conditions. And, you know, and I read this and I've wondered with my, particularly my great grandparents that came over in the mid 1880s from Scotland, how bad was it back in Scotland where it wasn't just my great-grandparents. My great-grandmother had a brother in his family that came over. My great-grandfather had three sisters and two half-sisters. His mother and his stepfather all came over. The only one that stayed back in Scotland was his older brother and his family. You know, and, and I read about the conditions on the ship and, and it's like, you know, how bad th yeah. were things yeah. back there that they, took that step. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm sure nobody told them it was gonna be quite that bad, bad, but rumor got back, you know, people would send letters back. And so, yeah, there, it, it was, you had to really wanna do this. do this. But when you think about it, if you had no land or if the land that you had was a small parcel, barely enough to feed your family and you were taxed on part of the production of that, um, you know, that, the idea that you could have 640 acres as a married man, mm -hmm. um, I mean, that, that's amazing. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, and the other thing, Texas had borders um, that needed to be um, protected. And so to get people into the state to help them with that frontier area was really something, too. Um, many of them never got there, but they stayed in, in the large in cities, cities because they heard about what's out there. <laughs> and plus the, you know, they, they still hadn't quite 
um, made peace with the Indians yet, and so a lot of people didn't quite make it to their future hand. Let me let me tell you a little bit about who John Ogerman was, and I'm going to just put I'm going to put this family tree chart up, and it, it you may not be able to tell, but there's there's sort of two different families there. Um, some unknown ancestor had two sons, we think. And I haven't gotten the DNA done yet, so I can't tell you for sure if they were truly brothers. But there's a Heinrich, and, Hin and then um, he married uh, Maria Cobbs, and that's my line. And then on the other side, there's um, John, and he married Catherine. And so, as many families do, John came over to Texas in 1842 as a single man, and he got a land grant. And he sort of, I'm, I'm thinking that he kind of did the reconnaissance sort of thing mm -hmm. and checked it out, got his land grant, um, and, and he settled enough so that then he could say, okay, because he was single. He didn't have a family that he had to worry that about. That was my great-grandfather. Yeah. And so once he did that in 1842, then my hypothesis is that then he went to Heinrich, who had four children, and said, okay, I've sort of made a place for us now, and I can tell you what the lay of the land is, and so come on over. That's what I think happened. Unfortunately, there are no reliable immigration records to tell me when they came over or how they came over. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the brick walls that I'm still trying to resolve. And, and uh, one of the ways that I've done that is to look at, first of all, look at the census. And my ancestor, my great-grandfather was only six years old. He was one of the children that came mm -hmm. over. And so a lot of what I have been able to get is through researching him. Mm. Um, and so in 1850, then, I do see a census, um, and it gives the ages of his brothers and sisters. And that's how I know if it's correct. Right. That's how I can at least come up with a range of when they were in Texas, because the last one was born in Texas, or the last two, and then the others were born in, in Hanover. So that helps me have a range. range yes. And it could be anywhere from 1842 to 1844, depending on. But at least now I, you know, I, I know a little bit. Now, I looked at subsequent senses that John, my, my John, filled out. And he, in two of those, in the 1900, the 1910, he said that he came in 1842, which would have been the same time that the uncle came. Okay. In the last one, in 1920, which is the last time they asked that kind of information, he said um, it was in um, 1845, I think. And, but he was 83 years old by then. Well, and there again, you don't know that he answered the question, too. Well, he probably did. I was just going to say know. at 83, he probably yeah. didn't. Yeah. Um, probably somebody else did who didn't really know. So does that mean that he actually came in 1842? I don't know. He, he could be off a year, you know, it's, I mean, I, I've seen somewhere they're spot on and others where they're really way off. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. De depending on the records that you can get to verify the information. The other thing that was difficult about that 1850 census, and so that would have been the first census from when he came, mm -hmm. right? So the children had nicknames of some sort. So there was nothing recognizable. And he was also living with his, in the household of his stepfather by then. So what happened to his dad? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, I'm sure he was around, but now he was gone. So he probably died. The mother remarried. And, um, and of course, you don't have death certificates. No death certificates. There, and, no. You know. and death certificates didn't come into play until the early 1900s. We, I did have, I mean, churches in, in that era, um, there are no church records surviving right. that I know of. And I've looked at, I mean, it was, there were only 4,000, 6,000 people in Harris County in, in 1850. 
Um, so, you know, I'm sure there was a church somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and John, I mean, I have wonderful records of the church that John's children were baptized in in the 1860s. But 1840, not so much. Yeah. Fortunately, in looking at DNA, in looking at not, not DNA precisely, but at least my matches, I connected with a match, and also I looked at some of the family trees, I was able to get the names of two of his siblings, okay. the real names, and how they came up with these names on the <laughs> census, I'll never know. But at least I do know that they are the real people. Um, and so we got that. Um, and then there, there are the family trees, there's family lore, my grandmother, uh, wrote down lots of names of people in the family. And so I know that the stepfather, this Maria, is really my great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother. And she married this guy named Henry Neiman. If you, if you look back to the chart, this is really interesting. If you look back to the chart, you see these two families here. So John didn't marry Catherine until after he was in Texas. So that eliminates him as the father of John. And then that Catherine, then John dies, and um, I mean, Johan, I'm calling the uncle Johan, just keep it straight. She marries this guy named Volmer. Maria, you know, Heinrich is already dead, and uh, Maria marries this guy named Neiman. Mm -hmm. They were neighbors. Volmer and Neiman were neighbors. Nice. And both of these women, the one thing that Texas did a good job was um, of was keeping all the marriages, and those are all digitized, mm -hmm. so I can go online and see it. And, and this one is wasn't digitized, but it was in a someone had had indexed all of it. They were both they both married as married women with the last name of Ogeman. So I know that tells me that they were both married mm -hmm. to Ogemans. And they married this, the neighbors on the same day at the same place. So let's get this all done. You know, yeah. we don't have husbands, we have children. And um, so we just... Well, and, and of course, that's, that's the thing that, that has been the question for years for genealogists is, how did couples meet? Yeah. You know, and, and people think in modern times of, oh, well, they could go, you know, here, there. And, People didn't have the transportation, so it was, what could you do with two feet? Right. You know, a horse and wagon. It, right. You know, so there were really lots of limitations. So it is intermarriage within communities early on. You know, there's so much to tell about this 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 family, but um, one thing that um, I wanted to say was that the way I think. Heinrich is the, the that I found the name of Heinrich and I have this land grant Remember I told you that I went into the index and I found this land, land grant. grant. Well, the, well, the land grant actually um, Says that the heirs of Heinrich Ogeman deceased okay. and the applicant is Marie Neiman the now Neiman, Neiman. And one of the witnesses, independent witnesses, is Volmer. So boy, does that tie things together. together. Yeah. And um, so now I'm pretty, now it says the heirs for benefit of the heirs, doesn't list the heirs. No. So my, aunt, my, my great grandfather is not listed at all. Well, and that was kind of the boilerplate of a lot of these documents. Mm -hmm. You know, didn't necessarily mean they had a lot of heirs. But, you know, it, they were covering the bases was kind of what they were doing. But here I have the only document that names him, mm -hmm. but it doesn't name John with it. So you call that indirect evidence, right? right? Right. And I need a whole bunch of it. Right. And so far, I, this is, I mean, I'm having to link Maria together. And it's, actually, that document is is really a good one, yeah. but I still need other things. 
because Heinrich doesn't show up in any census. He's already dead in, in the 1850 census, and he wasn't here in the 1840s. 40s. So, and I don't have an immigration thing, so I, how many pieces of information do I need to be able to say it's Heinrich, that is right. his name? Right. And this, this points out why you can't just look at you know, the, the family, you have to look at collateral family members and, and neighbors and, and things like that because, you know, just piecing it together and you never know what you're going to find in somebody else's documents. The good news is that the Vollmer Cemetery ah. has the graves of many of these people. And so, um, and by the way, this cemetery is surrounded by houses on all sides. Right. So the, the Vollmers or the Neemans, whoever owned it, um, that particular plot um, must have sold off everything else to developers. And you literally have to either go through somebody's backyard or I don't know. Uh, but, but early on, that, that happened a lot. Uh, and what, what I have seen in deeds is they sell off the family farm. They, they buried family on the farm. Yeah. They sold off the family farm. And there's a provision to give them access so they can, can yeah. get there. Right. So. Well, well, there is a gate, one <laughs> little gate by the side of somebody's property line. And you've got to, you know, get, get permission to do that. But, um, but now they will tell you, the people uh, will tell you that, you know, that he was buried there, but there's no marker. marker. Well, I could go on and on about this, but um, I, you know, it, maybe I'll come back when I, yeah. I have the answers. And this is this is fascinating, and and I think it's helpful to see that everybody doesn't just sit down at a computer, type it in, and it all comes no. to you. No, <laughs> I saw the original land grants in in Austin. Um, and I went to Houston for some of the original uh, information there, and I've been to courthouses everywhere. And I just want to encourage everybody to come to the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society meetings. Uh, we're still on Zoom, uh, mvgenealogy.org. You're all welcome, and we have interesting programs every month, and we hope you'll join us. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you for coming, Janelle. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Especially compared to Little New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wasn't trying to brag. I know Texans no. do brag, no, but, but but it is good to understand. Yeah. <laughs>